Uh, what if somebody thinks you're a Cowboys fan or something? Well, everybody's allowed to have. <laughs> well, I, what I what I was taught is it doesn't matter what people think That's or right. say about me. Yes, right. It's none of my business. That's right. I don't think I wear too much 49er stuff. <laughs> I don't think anybody would ever get that screwed up. You know, like <laughs> yeah. It's, I was in one prison. I saw a guy with a a Cowboys beat, and I go, "Are you a Niner fan?" He goes. He didn't like it. <laughs> he talking about? I'm just having fun. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> all right, cool. So, uh. Not so anonymous to the. No, I can't do that. <laughs> Not so anonymous to EJ Rekka. Um, Chris, thank you for coming down and doing this for us. I appreciate you being here. Is he filming it right now? Yeah, yeah. we're on. Yeah. Oh. We're live. Yeah, okay. so I'm here with, uh, we got Chris Mullen on the podcast. Um, and, I, and I typically like to start this thing by talking about how the person I'm interviewing came into my life. Okay. Right? And so I was exposed to you the first time when I was in um, rehab, right? I was at the Salvation Army program. And uh, one of the people said, oh, we have a, a special guest tonight. Chris Mullen is coming in to speak. And in my mind, I'm a big Warrior fan. So I'm like, we're, the shooting forward for the Golden State Warriors is coming in to speak to us, right? Um, but so that night, you know, you were in front of speaking in front of the, in front of the guys, and um, I was drawn to you. You know, your message resonated with me. Um, and so I think it's even more phenomenal, not only that you came in there to deliver that message, but also that I've been able to reach out to you since I've been out of treatment. You've come out here and, and spoke um, at our 12-step fellowship for some events we were having. And I'm just extremely grateful that you're part of my journey. Yes. Um, so, again, thank you for coming out here and doing this yes. for us. Um, so I always like to start the podcast by asking, what, what's your clean date? July 10th, 1997. And what does that mean to you? Uh, wow. I, you know, it's, it's weird uh, that you asked that because for 20 years I was involved in the drug scene and all that good stuff. And, uh, and, and now I've got more than that clean. Right. I love it. I love this. new. I can't, I wouldn't have never imagined this new way of life. Awesome. It's, it's great. And so, um, we always like to, you know, for the unengaged, somebody that may not be familiar with recovery, um, they're probably looking at you and they're like, this guy doesn't look like a drug addict, right? He doesn't look like, and so we, I like to go back, right. And talk about like, what were things like for like a young Chris, like growing up, like what did life look like for you? You know? Uh, wow. Uh, well, my dad was drunk every single day. And, uh, and, and so, um, uh, that was the example that I had. And I remember when I was 13 or 14, he stabbed me in the hand with a fork at the dinner table. Right. So there was uh, uh, getting high and, uh, and violence in my home. And I decided, you know what, uh, I, I'm going to do it better than that. And, and I started, uh, uh, use, uh, or selling fireworks. And then I started selling drugs at age 14. Wow. So things in, so, you know, and as a kid growing up, like this is all you see. It's all I knew. So this is just a natural progression of things like yes. monkey see monkey do. Right. And, um, so, getting into those behaviors at such an early age in your life, like, like, what does that lead? Like, I mean, kid 14, getting into the drug trade, things like, 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 what does that look like? You know, where were you, where are you born and raised? Where are you from? San Jose. San Jose. Okay. I started using drugs at age 12 and selling them at age 14. Then I went into juvenile county and state prison facilities. Okay. And so that was your whole, that's all I knew your whole upbringing was just basically. And so from the time that you, um, were a young man to the time that you got locked up. Did you spend, uh, you spent most of your, your adolescent years behind bars in some form or another? <clears throat> I wouldn't say most of the time, but a lot of time. Yeah. And so like, what does that, I mean, like, what does that look like for you growing up? I mean, you know, could you elaborate on, you know, I didn't like getting locked up, but I knew it was part of the deal based on what I did. Yeah. My lifestyle. Yeah. And so, um, what, when, so you got, what, what age did you get clean at? 32. 32. So I got to imagine there's a lot of things that happen between 14 and 32. Like, what does it look like? Like, where does it take you to the point to where it's like, man, like I realize I, cause we, we know in recovery, the change only comes from us, 
right? And only knowing one way of life, like what are the, the process of events that lead you to the point to where you're like, man, I have to make some changes here. This, <coughs> is, this isn't working for me. Well, I, it's, it, I think at 15, my teacher gave me a really bad grade, right? Uh-huh. And I decided that uh, I would talk to him about the, the, the grade, and that was the second to last day of school, and he didn't show up that day, so being as compassionate as I am, I figured out he must have been sick, right? Yeah. But I saw him at the mall that day, and I'm like, ooh, teacher cut class, <laughs> I got something for you. And I burned his classroom down. Oh, Jesus. And they really frowned on that. Yeah, yeah, I'd imagine. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that was the beginning of, uh, of, of, of this craziness, right? And, uh, and uh, it just evolved. I, I went from being a, a partier to a drug dealer to a, uh, a convict and going to prison and being shot in the face and all, I can go on and on. And it was just, that's all I knew. So right. I, I got, I, to answer your question, I actually... Uh, um, was out of prison and I was got a deep driving on the influence of meth and uh, um, and I was on a jail cell floor again going something's got to change something's got to change and that's why when when I heard this uh, I'm a recovering addict my sponsor at the time said this and I go what does that mean right I don't know anything and he goes uh, he goes I was here and I'm going here so I've stuck with that right I'm not a drug addict I'm a recovering addict right which means I was over here and I'm going over here now Right, right. And so getting getting clean at that age, I mean, like, what does that look like? I mean, I got to imagine you, you had a certain set of beliefs, right? Living, you know, in such a way from the time of early uh, teenage years yes. all the way up until you're, you're a young man. Um, do you, like, so I know you talked about saying something's got to change, right? But when was recovery introduced to you? Was it introduced to you behind bars, um, or did you experience the twelve-step recovery program when you were when you were not in trouble? I mean, what what did that look like for you? How were you introduced to the life of recovery? Um, when I was eighteen years old, I had two DUIs in two weeks, which is perfectly normal, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and they suggested that I start going to meetings to get my slip signed, and I did, but I wasn't planning on on uh, getting sober at that time I just wanted to uh, uh, not go to jail and right. uh, and I knew that I started signing the cards with my left hand nobody's ever tried that probably <laughs> and then I started using different pen colors yeah and then I went to prison five times after that so I don't think that worked no uh, <laughs> <laughs> So that was uh, the process, and, and just so you know how crazy it was, I remember one time it was like five to two, and I was on parole for prison, and, uh, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm pretty smart, and it's almost two in the morning, and I don't want them to stop selling beer, so I picked up some beer, right? And then I'm driving away, and it's kind of a windy road, and there was a cop pulling somebody over, and I remember how smart I am? I didn't want him to, to but I, I go, I better slow down. My brake's locked, and I hit the cop car. <laughs> yeah, there went that parole. <laughs> So that's how crazy it was. Yeah, it sounds like. And so like being introduced to recovery at 18 and then going another, you know, what is that? Another 12 years, 14 years, another 14 years out there. Yes. Um, did it at all dawn to you? Like, maybe I should go back and hang out with those people. No, maybe they have the answers to my problems. No. Right. And that's how, that's how deceiving this disease is, right? Like you're introduced to the solution 14 years before you ever decide to make a change. It takes yes. a lot more. Yes. And um, so would you say like the seed was planted at that time or the was seed it was planted? And so at the age, you said you got clean at the age of 34, right? 32. 32. So um, where does that change happen? Is it another court card or is it like, you know, finding a meeting or is it a treatment facility or... <coughs> Um, I, I was on the jail cell floor again, and I go, something has to change. And I knew about the court card thing, and I had a case pending, and I started going to meetings. And, uh, and I learned how to live without using drugs. But for me, it was more than just drug addiction. It was addiction to the lifestyle. Right. And so it took a long time to break away from that lifestyle. And uh, in my mind, as it, it took years. But uh, now I'm nobody would even know that I come from that world now. Right, right. And that's the beautiful thing about recovery, 
right? And so was it like a, we call it an H and I panel, like hospitals and institutions. Is that where you were exposed to it the second time or was no. it when you got out? I, I just knew from, from when I was 18. From when you are 18. And so, so then at 32, <coughs> getting back into recovery, I got to imagine you're not the person I see today as far as your attitudes no and way. mannerisms and no things way. of that nature. So what does early recovery look like for a Chris? Do you just walk in there and say, hey, man, I'm Chris. I got a problem. Can you help me? Because I know most of us can't do that when we walk in. You know, uh, It was a process, and uh, I'm trying to maintain my old uh, behaviors. And uh, um, just to give you an example, I was looking for a picture of a guy that I met in prison and, and in the security housing unit. And uh, I found an old picture of me, and there were five of us, and we'd been, I'd been up for a couple of days on meth, and one of the guys was a collector for the uh, Hells Angels, and uh, one of the other guys was... Uh, um, he was actually the strongest of us, and he was a fighting fool. And then one of the other guys was in an outlaw biker gang and asked a prospect three times. And I go, wow, that is the world that I come from. Right. That's what seemed attractive. So that's all I knew. Yeah. So, so where does that shift happen, right? Like, and I think that's the miracle that a lot of people don't realize. You can go from this is my life. This is all I know. This is what I want. And that perspective shifts to where it says I want a new way of life. Yes. Um, and so – um, the early phases of recovery, like, I mean, do you go in there and pick up a sponsor, start doing what people do, or you're just hanging out waiting for the change to happen? Uh, no, I was doing some of that stuff, but, uh, I was learning how to different behaviors, right. That I had never used before. It's like, wow. Uh, one guy talked about holding the door for people. And I thought, wow, little stuff like that. Right. Um, what, what does that mean? Yeah. And now I do it all the time, but, uh, it was a process of learning how to, uh, consider other people's needs ahead of mine learning a completely new way to yes, live yes. as a human being. Yes. Um, and so like shifting from, from that early phase, like, I mean, like <coughs> what, like what are some of the gifts that, that recovery has given you like along this journey? I'm going to tell you that recovery has not been easy for me. And in the old behavior, I wanted to go back to that, especially when my wife was living with her boyfriend on my street. Right. Huh. And, uh, and I wanted to go back to that old behavior, believe me. Uh, but uh, I had to push through this new way of life. So I've heard you tell that story before. That was one of the things that, that stuck with when me. When I only had four years. Yeah. And so, like, how does one deal with something like that? Like, especially the way you knew how to do things, which sounded like violence and chaos. And, and then now you have this situation going on. And on my all, street. And, you're, and by all means, you're a free man at this point. You could yes. do whatever you want. Yes. And so, like, how do you deal with those types of things? I mean, like, what, is that, what does that story look like? I mean, I'm sure – do you want to share it? Uh, yes, it was crazy. And, and when I met my ex-wife, I was uh, a catch, and I was on, out of prison for one day, and I was a drug dealer for a living, right? Yeah. I was a total catch. <laughs> and so the man she married was that guy, not this guy that's, that's clean and, and doing a whole new way of life, right? Yeah, and, and now it makes sense, but at the time it kind of hurt my feelings. Uh, I'm sure, right? <laughs> and I'm sure, and and I think little things like that are what force a lot of people to go back to that way of life. It was right? close. Yeah, and so do you learn to lean on the fellowship in those ways, <coughs> or it was that you know? Because like I often talk about my recovery, right? Like, and I and I put you know the God of my understanding above everything because I understand there's going to be certain points in my life where I'm not going to be fortunate enough for somebody to pick up the phone right in that second. So, I mean, what are the tools that you have at four years to deal with a situation like that? Can you remember? Um, I had five separate offers to remove the boyfriend. Well, her, I'm so bad. They'll never come back or we can remove them permanently. You pick. I never asked anybody to do anything. And I had to choose uh, this new way of life. Right. And or so going back to the old ways. And, do it. and going back to the old ways probably would have meant it would have been pretty for dire for it you at that point. For you. Yeah. And so, um, like, what are you doing now? Like, so we've touched a, a little bit on what life was like then. Like, what do you do now? Because I know you do some pretty incredible things in the community <coughs> right now. So now I lead a ministry, right? And we're in we're a prison ministry, and we're in 20 prisons in three states. And it's, it's, we have 100 volunteers. It's huge. And it's like, wow, I would have never thought that staying clean would turn into this, but it certainly has. And remember, I'm a recovering addict, right? So right. I came from here, and I'm moving over here. And so what is that process from convict 
to preacher look like? Like, how does that manifest in somebody's life? Uh, it doesn't make any sense. Give right. God the glory for all that. Right. Otherwise, it wouldn't make any sense. So how did you get into the ministry from, you know what I'm saying? I, I'm just trying to think in my head, like, here we go from, you know, getting out of prison, getting into recovery. And, like, how does, did you start, like, attending a church and then it just snowballed from there? Um, you know, it really started with uh, me hearing Christmas carols in my cell at San Quentin, right? Mm -hmm. And I couldn't see him because my door was closed. Uh, but I could hear I hear the songs, and a seed was planted. And I did another term after that, and I did drugs for seven more years. So I was far from done, but a seed was planted. And when I started working at this company, and I was selling furniture, and you could say, you don't have any experience selling furniture. Yeah. I sold drugs for 16 years. <laughs> I do have experience selling. And <laughs> okay. And, uh, and the, one of my coworkers, her husband, used to go in with a guy and sing Christmas carols, and that door was closed because the guy stopped doing it. Or so I thought, and uh, and I told the owner of my company, this is in 2003, I, what I wanted to do, and he goes, no, this is 98, sorry, uh, 98, I said, I told him uh, what I wanted to do, and he goes, you need to call Kevin, I called Kevin, and Kevin goes, I can't help you with San Quentin, but I can get you into CYA, that's the youth prison, that was 1999. Wow, and so it just snowballed from there, yes. you started in the youth authority, yes. and then... I have to imagine you guys are in almost every prison up and down California, right? Uh, well, actually, there's a lot of prisons in California. There's 36. We're wow. in, we're in uh, like 20 of them. Well, I mean, that's that's a pretty good ratio, yes. 20 out of 36. Not bad. And so, you know, so um, what keeps you around? You know, I got to imagine, you know, there's a lot of people that get to a certain point in recovery and then they kind of just back off. Like what keeps you involved in the recovery process? Um, well, I'm reminded that uh, if when I first got clean, if nobody had been around that had been, been here a while, I wouldn't have stayed clean, right? Yeah. And so I want to give a little bit back and give people hope that if I can get clean, anybody can. Right. So. And, and you just. I'm staying connected with that. You just showed me a, a, a beautiful chip when you walked up, right? Yes. A 25-year medallion yes, yes. given to you by a guy that you help in That's the recovery right. process. Yes. So what do like little moments like that in your life mean to you? I mean, like, can you touch on, on that, what is given back to you? Oh, my gosh. It's, it's overwhelming. I even had uh, uh, my uh, ex-wife's husband... Uh, gave me a kiss on the cheek a few months ago. I was like, <laughs> whoa. And he said, you know what? He goes, I know where you come from, and I know if you can do it, I can do it. Right. And he goes, you're like a big brother to me, and you don't even know it. He's watching everything I do, he said. So would you say, like, your recovery, like most people's, would be like a ripple effect, like the, the pebble drops in the pond, and the ripples just keep going and going and going? Unbelievable like that, yes. That's pretty yes. amazing. Cause I, so I got a call from a guy that, that I help, right? And I, I, you know, I'm six and a half years into this thing, so I'm starting to experience some of these miracles, yes, yes, right? Yes, yes, yes. And um, I took this man to the insane asylum in San Joaquin County. We were friends in high school. Yes. And um, he shot me a text, and he said, hey, I just got done dropping off a guy at the same program that we both went to in, in Stockton. yes. And I said, man, you remember that night um, that you that I took you to the insane asylum, right? And he's and he's got a few years clean. He's got a good career going. And he's like, yeah, I can never thank you enough for that. And I said, you did today, right? Like, I didn't do it for the thank you. And, and the feeling that I got from that process is what I think will keep me coming back for the rest of my life, you know, is and so I'm just barely starting to get those feelings like that. So I can only imagine what that feels like. <clears throat> all those guys that were in that picture, uh, uh, they, they, well, all the one that I know of have totally changed their lives. Wow. And these are guys from some of the heaviest backgrounds. Yes, exactly. So, I mean, like, what do you tell a guy like that? Like when you're sitting, you know, in, in San Quentin or one of these prisons, like, how do you tell somebody that they have an opportunity at a new way of life when they've been, when they know no, nothing else? 
So I'm at Pleasant Valley and I'm walking the, the track, right? And he's, I'm walking, I'm going to open up the chapel. I got the keys now, right? And these guys are walking the track and I go, you guys want to know a miracle? And they're, they're, wa- they're moving, right? And I said, and they go, yeah. And I go, I used to be in blue and now I got the keys. <laughs> so just knowing that a guy that came from their world can do this, right? Yeah. And, and do those guys believe you? Because I remember yes. when I got into, tr- when I first walked into a, a 12-step, you know, fellowship, I looked at all the people and I had no trust, right? Like I was like, these guys are all liars. Like there's no way this guy's been clean for 25 exactly. years, right? Exactly. Um, but I mean, do are they receptive to the message? Are people, you know, receptive to that message that you can change? Yes. That's a beautiful thing. Um, you know, and, and so, um, yes, like, what would you, what would you tell somebody right now that might be out there like struggling with addiction and they don't think there's a way out? Like, I mean, is there something that you, that you would typically tell a person like that? Uh, well, I, I, I was, my, my ex brother in law we've actually fist fought, so we weren't very close Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and, uh, we're both ex-convicts and anxious all that, and I don't care, right? And uh, I wasn't going to go to his funeral, but he was my kid's uncle, so I go, right? Mm-hmm. And at the funeral, most of your family's probably really well to do, and most of mine were bikers. So half the people at the funeral in their biker gear, which is very spiritual. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> and I'm at the funeral going, man, his best friend back in the day was was Robert Perez, and how am I going to find this guy? i got to tell him that his friend died, right? And the first guy that comes up to me after the funeral is Robert Perez. And before I could say anything, he goes, man, I heard about you he goes you're a minister now and I go yeah and he goes I don't even believe in God but I might now yeah <laughs> <laughs> oh wow. that that's phenomenal right yes. like and that's you know in in when I was sitting there in the Salvation Army in in the wooden yeah. pew and you're up there and you're full of hope yes and love and in an excitement for a new way of life I had again trust issues I had a hard time saying this, this, this guy lived this life. Right. And I mean, for me, I, I get to see these miracles every day. And for somebody that's, that's watching this, this, people like yourself are the mission statement for this podcast to expose somebody to a person like you that has, has lived basically two lives, right? Like, so what, (coughs) yes, what does that process look like of unwiring all those old behaviors? And, you know, cause you said you were more addicted to the life sometimes than the drugs. And and that's what the misconception is. We, we suffer from the disease of addiction. We don't suffer from drug use, right? The disease of addiction. It's all of it. Yeah. It's all. I remember even at two years clean, uh, playing some of the old music I used to let's do missing the old days. I missed all that. Right. I missed the lifestyle. And so, like, what is that process of unwiring all those old behaviors? I had to break away from all of it. Break away. That means the people, Everything. the places, the things, right? I still stayed in contact with these guys, but I, I couldn't uh, be around them anymore. I couldn't hang out. Yeah. And so, I mean, and it even has to go further than that because probably you by yourself weren't the best guy at the beginning either, too, right? So is that all through, like, the step working process? And, I mean, how, what does that look like, I mean, for, for yourself? <clears throat> so this one uh, lady had told me that uh, her brother was a meth cooker, and, uh, and her mom, she was talking to her mom on the phone, her mom says he was just, you know, with the wrong crowd. And she goes, Mom, he is the wrong crowd. <laughs> 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 I was definitely the wrong crowd, right? Yeah. Things have changed, though. Yeah, things have changed, you know. And so, um, like, so if somebody is, like, watching this and they want to get in contact with your organization or the things that you do, how would they go about finding you or finding information to where they can get help? Um, Our website is www.mercyandgrace.org. Yeah. That's the ministry that I lead. And and they can find help, you know, resources on where to find help. Yes. Um, And so... You know, I'm, I'm trying to, like, even think about, um, you know, what to ask you next. I mean, I, I, we've pretty much touched on a lot of these things. Um, is there anything that you want to share that, that might be impactful that somebody might hear? Um, <clears throat> um, there's so much, you guys, but I'm going to tell you that, uh, uh, um, that uh, uh, you can go come from that world and live totally different now. 
right? You can do that. You can recover. You're, I'm a recovering addict, right? I was here, and now I'm moving over here. And I know I said that before, but I think it's really important that we know that we can come from that world and live a totally different way. Yeah, and both of us sitting here today are a testament, right? And we. And what's funny is, is I can sit here and I can listen to what you're saying, and I can see the similarities, even though our backgrounds may be completely different. None of that matters anymore. It's not who you were. It's where you're going. Yeah. And, and that can be, and, and the funny thing is I think there's a, there's a misconception about recovery and what the recovery process looks like. And maybe even through a 12 step fellowship, right? Like, they see people, and um, there's this idea of disparity, right? Like it's they, it's always gonna be that way, but that's not the case, right? Not the case at all. Like we have like another living testament <coughs> that you know we do recover and we can stop using, um, lose the desire to and use, change our behaviors and change our behaviors, yes. right? And 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 it's funny because um, even talking to you, like you share a lot of these things. But do you still find um, discomfort in the way that you used to live compared to how you live now? I was actually uh, uh, on the on a trip with my church, uh, Footsteps of the Apostle Paul, in 2000. And for two years, I had gone to church, but nobody was going to know my history. Nobody. Yeah. And uh, that was the first time I shared it with somebody. Now I don't even care. But, uh, but there was a point there where I was afraid that people would judge me because of how I used to live, right? But, uh, yeah, now I'm free. I don't yeah. care. And, it, and it's almost, and I think that's another uh, reason for this podcast is sometimes behind the veil of anonymity, it's really hard to reach out and help somebody, right? And, and I just appreciate people like yourself and the people that have been on already that aren't scared to come out and say, hey, you know, I lived a certain type of way, but that's not me today. No way. I can start here and I can end up over here. Would you believe that there's a hundred volunteers uh, now that are I'm 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 the I'm the leader of this ministry, right? And and I would have never seen this day coming, but it just started with getting clean and then changing some behaviors. And now look what's happening, right? Yeah. This one woman, she actually uh, I never went to church. My parents never took me to church, right? And this woman took me when I was eight and when I was a little kid. And uh, and then over the years they moved out of state, and my dad stayed in touch with them, and he'd be telling me how bad their kids are doing, and I'm. Thinking, they're not going to prison it can't be that bad and uh and then i got clean and got a hold of this woman it had been almost 20 years and i go patty it doesn't make any sense based on my lifestyle and out of prison being shot in the face which hurts by the way uh <laughs> <laughs> don't try that at home i go i go it doesn't make any sense and uh, i believe that if i hadn't accepted jesus christ i never would have made it so i'm calling to thank you and she goes and i don't hear anything i go patty are you there and she's weeping she goes, Chris, I've been praying for you for 20 years. Wow. That's, that's pretty. Sp so would you, like all these things that you've been through in your life, yes. would you say that it was God that carried you all the way to, <coughs> you know, because it can't be your plan, right? It can't be my I plan. I believe that God carried me all the way through, yes. I mean, that's, that's amazing, right? And what did your, so, you know, you're a man of faith today, yes. right? And that's probably the main focal point in your life. Yes. And you talk about growing up in a house that was less than religious. Not at all. And so um, does do you ever look in the mirror and be like, man, how did I get here? Only God could have done this. Yeah. Otherwise, it wouldn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense, no. right? And it doesn't have to make sense. No. That's the beautiful thing about it, right? Um, and so and I'm exactly like you were, man. When I first got clean, these people with five and 10 years, I knew they were lying. There was no way you could stay clean that long. And now I know that that's not true. We can, we can, we do. We can and stay we clean for years and, uh, we can live a totally different way of life. Right. Right. And, um, you know, and, and so I, again, you know, I just appreciate you staying, you know, cause if it wasn't. You know, and that's the funny thing is like people like you just go on about your life, right? They ask you to speak at this certain place and you don't know if, if you're going to touch one person in that crowd or nobody, right? And you just keep moving about your life, right? So <coughs> was there anybody like early on in your recovery that, that, that touched you that way, that, that, that changed that perspective? 
there wasn't one uh, person in particular I can point to, but there was little things like, really, I can hold the door for people? Really, I can do that? Really, I can stay clean? Really? Yeah. And, and just little nuggets like that were like, wow, the, the thought of, of long-term recovery made no sense to me. Yeah, because it absolutely is. It's I didn't true. realize that, you know, because I was fortunate enough to, I had lots of grandparents in my life. I had, you know, a, a stable somewhat stable, you know, family at home. So I was taught the difference between right and wrong, right? Like I knew, and, and I got to the point where I was doing things that I knew was, were wrong, but I couldn't stop myself. Right? I didn't understand that there was people that didn't know the difference between right and wrong. <coughs> so, uh, um, I remember when I was 14, I started selling drugs, but at 16, I saw the movie Scarface and I go, Oh, I'm going to be a drug dealer just like him. And then when I paroled the first time, I, I paroled to my grandma's house. Did Tony Montana live with his grandma? No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> that plan went out the window. <laughs> well, they didn't. It might have been cut out in the director's. I've never seen the director's cut of Scarface. <laughs> so. <laughs> so so as you go on, some of these these misconceptions or mistruths totally. in your head are, are completely proven wrong yes, time yes, and time over and over again. again. Yeah, and so I mean. You know, I think I think we pretty much hit it. You know, um, Chris, I enjoy. So one, one more, one yeah, more. Please right? give me as much okay. as you can. Okay, so uh, uh, my my wife leaves, and I don't want to deal with where's your wife at Christmas. You know about that, right? And my yeah. dad says, "Son, I bought you a plane ticket to go to Salt Lake City to spend Christmas with your brother and his family." And I'm thinking, perfect. I don't have to deal with where's your wife. Yeah. And I get to Salt Lake City, and I ask my brother. Uh, where's the churches? And he takes me to one that's closed and one that's open. And that's where I go. And the reverend there does ministry at Utah State Prison. So we connected, right? Yeah. Now, I knew I was flying home on Tuesday. My brother thought I'd said Monday, but he figured I would know, you would think. And on, on Monday, I get a call from my dad. I'm having coffee with his reverend. And I get a call from my dad. And he goes, he goes I go, Dad, I'm having coffee right now. Can I call you back? And he goes, where are you at? And, I, and, and he goes, I go, oh, I'm, I'm at a coffee shop. And he goes, uh, I'm at the airport. Where are you? <laughs> and I'm going, God, what are you doing? My dad's mad. I'm, I'm a day off. I'm paying fees, switch flights. What's going on here? And I get on the later flight and I sit next to this woman and I go, and, and, and I go, what do you do? And she goes, IT, what do you do? And I go, prison ministry. And she goes, my son's in prison. He's in Montana State Prison. And, uh, and we're flying along, and then she starts weeping, and she says, uh, you know, it's the second time in prison, all the drugs he's doing. I go, you know what, man? I've been in prison myself a little bit, and I've been off drugs for 11 years. I go, if God can do it for me, he can do it for your son. And she goes, God put you on this plane. Right. There's no coincidences. Yes. Yeah. We're right where God wants us to be. Exactly. Man, I think that's it. Yes. Chris, I, I appreciate you doing this. And we end this thing the same way every time. We end it with a hug. Okay. So you owe me a hug. <laughs> okay, I, I can do that. Oh, uh, Chris. Thank you, bro. Hey, thank you so much. I appreciate yes. you. <coughs> Was that okay, Jesse? Oh, perfect. Okay, yeah. okay.